Hey, buddy. Good morning, tennis fans. Yeah. Hey. So, uh, Jeff, thanks again for uh, agreeing to, to join us. My pleasure, Fred. Uh, on our, on our uh, Tennis Warehouse internet channel. <laughs> cool. There's not been a lot of activity recently. You know, there have been other things distracting uh, at Jeff and I, the mm -hmm. other at Jeff from uh, Jeff Brown from yeah. our video reviews. But uh, we're going we're gonna to take flight again today. And there's, there's definitely been uh, a warm reception to the insights that you offered back in January. <laughs> up in the office, yeah. Up in the office in the spa. And so uh, what I thought we might do today is um, field a couple of questions that have come up over the last, I don't know, really number of years uh, on, on Tennis Warehouse. So there's been a lot of debate about it. And then uh, we were lucky enough to get a, a specific technique question. Which okay. I thought, and uh, this particular question, uh, I thought who better than uh, my good friend Jeff to answer because it's about the one handed back end. Sure, great. Okay. Fire away. Yeah, so one of the things that's been discussed at length now is just how relevant the ability to hit a 100 ball rally would be. And again, assuming that it wasn't a patty cake effort, that it was, you know, hitting firm balls deep, mm -hmm. you know, with control, varying pace and spin, 100, 100 balls. Just, just how relevant to the game of tennis do you think, as, you know, I guess it's not blowing it up to say one of the winningest Division I coaches of all time. So you, you've taught a few talented players. You were ATP player yourself. How, how relevant do you think it is? You know, it's funny, when, when, I, when you first posed that question to me, I thought, not very. And then I thought about it in, in terms of match content. If you study Craig O'Shaughnessy's work on brain game tennis, um, most rallies are zero to four points. The typical rally on the men's tour right now is one. That's the most common length of rally, a serve and a missed return, and then it goes to three, a serve, a return, and, and either a winner or an error in the first ball. Um, however, that said, I think there's tremendous value in that kind of consistency for a couple of reasons. One is mentality, the ability to concentrate, focus uh, single-mindedly on you know, we've got to keep the ball to play, no matter uh, no matter the length of the point, you're striving to be aggressive and not miss. Uh, there's so many points are donated, just given, given away. Um, also, just that kind of mastery of the racket of one's body, uh, of concentrating, I think it, it, it does have value. We do a drill with the Vanderbilt women's team where we'll go six minutes and see how few errors they can make. When they're playing well, it's, it's fewer than three in six minutes pretty good. That's a pretty high level of tennis. Yeah. And I, I know one of the drills that you like is uh, also a drill where you try to see how many balls you can hit in a particular number of minutes, like in the court. So sure. five or six minutes. I remember you talking to me about that, that that number reflects how early you're taking the ball and how aggressively you're taking the ball while yeah. still maintaining within the lines. Since hitting it outside the lines is really not that helpful. No. <laughs> and you know, you, you're, that reminded me of a drill, a tempo drill where you see how many balls you can hit in a minute to one another. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're trying, you're striving for a high number. So that's high tempo, getting the ball, taking it early, and making the shot. The, a good number for our team is when they can get into the 40s. Um, I believe the top men's players, Federer and Nadal, can probably get into the 50s in a minute. Just very, you're up on the ball, there's no waste of time. That's a different kind of drill than going for 100 in a row where you're not trying to take it quite as early. Yeah, so that's that's very that's very helpful. Um, I think another thing that's been uh, bandied about quite a bit is what level of player it takes to start putting up a real fight against a, a female pro, even a female pro who's not at the absolute apex of the game. And this there's all actually been multiple threads about this. There was one in particular discussing Kamiko Date Crum, who as we know is in her 40s now. And has a, I guess she's smaller in stature, has a more um, defensive-minded game, and there was some discussion that even maybe four-level players uh, who, who might have crafty play or uh, an unusual serve, maybe a lefty serve or an especially powerful serve, uh, there was some discussion uh, about that. So I'm curious what your insights are because I know not only you know do you, do you coach high-level women, but part of your role over the years has been to play them. You were an ATP player yourself, champion of the ACC back in the Long day. So. Ago, yeah. <laughs> pretty, pretty tough player. Um, so which, what are your thoughts about it? What point do the men start to really intersect the curve with the women at the, at the elite levels of the game? Not at 4.0. Um, 
Um, sorry, guys. Uh, first of all, it's a, it's, a, it's a hypothetical that I kind of wonder where it's going. It's not going to happen. Um, I guess it's the attempt of what's the difference between men's tennis and women's tennis. And uh, First of all, the women's game's gotten a lot deeper. Back when I played, um, 100 in the world in the women's was not as good a player as she is today. That's a, that's a phenomenal athlete. Witness Monica Puig winning the Olympic gold yesterday at ranked 34 in the world beating. There's just more parity. There's much more training and athleticism. Um, Kamiko Date, though in her 40s, is still, I think, top 80 in the world. Great return to serve. Experienced. Um, you know, she competes. She's competed not just in tennis. I believe she ran marathons when she retired for over a decade. So she's kind of a special case. Um, but, but again, very, very good. Uh, you, you know, a guy, or, I mean, the men's tour and the athleticism, just think of the gender differences. A, a six foot, 190 pound guy is going to, with a big serve, can hold his own against a lot of the top women. Um, but that, again, I would think it would be more, more in the 5'5, five, 6'0 five, range. Uh, and again, you can watch tennis and it doesn't translate. The, the, the other thing about it is someone can beat you love and love winning 55% of points. Uh, so you may be, feel like you're dead even, they're winning that extra 7, 8, 9, 10% of points and you're not getting many games. Again though, with a big serve, they, you may be able to do it, but I've seen Kamiko Date return Serena pretty well. So, uh, you know, I think there are other ways to spend your mental energy in <laughs> contemplating this particular uh, fact. <laughs> Mental advice mixed into to yeah. answering one of the There's a lot of other questions. stuff to worry about. <laughs> uh, and mental training, that's something we could we could spend a whole sure. segment on mental training, I think. And can you train? That's just another thing that comes up. Can you train mentally? And I think that's a, maybe another topic for, for another day. But, sure. Uh, I know I can speak from a little bit of experience hitting with your team from time to time. And, of course, with Micah, uh, who was herself, uh, Sean, top 50, top 24, I think, in the case of Micah, uh, I can I can say that the ball you're facing and the degree of skill, uh, not only skill, but uh, competitive spirit and grit is a different thing when you run across on any recreational court. Yeah, I mean, uh, Micah Babel uh, played, was the assistant here for three years, was top 25 in the world, played 19 slams, held her own. Uh, and if you watched her play, nothing would wow you. But again, it's that mentality of setting up. Also, the decision making of a top pro is going to be probably better than someone who has a day job. Um, they're going to run wide, and instead of floating a chip back, they'll get it at your feet if you're coming in. They'll put the ball where you don't want it if they're if they're indeed world class. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. And, and last but certainly not least, we have, we have a technical question, and I'm going to pose the question and stand aside and give you a little bit of room, but um, there's been some discussion again about the resurgence of the one-handed backhand, mm -hmm. uh, maybe even a disproportionate number of the very top players starting to show up again with one-handed backhands. And uh, obviously, one of the best one-handed backhands I've ever faced is, is yours. Uh, don't, true. True statement. So um, I'm wondering if, if there were a technical tip that you were going to give on the one-handed backhand, what, what would you say for someone trying to build a really effective and reliable, I know you talk about structure mm -hmm. and uh, building a foundation that will hold up under pressure, what are the key things that you would want that player to know? Uh, strengthen the grip, understand the footwork approach, how quickly you have to attack a ball with your feet to get behind it. Um, uh, I would study some of the best one-handers. Vavrinka to me has the most fundamentally sound one hander. If you look at Gasquet, there's a lot more wrist and whip. That's very hard to learn. Even Federer has a little bit of a, of a loose wrist on some of his backhands. Vavrinka's is, is money. Dominic Teams is, is really good. But strengthening the grip and getting the uh, getting the knuckle over so you can, as you come in, you can hit and really drive through the ball. Um, if you watch the top players from the baseline, they load really quickly. If they can get it, they absolutely crush it. If it's out wide or low, they can they can move the grip over and hit a really good underspin. Uh, the variety of the one-hander is hard to beat, especially when you get to a grass court. Um, you know, you look at the success of the one-handers, it's, uh, it's probably most prominent on grass with Federer, 
Gasquet tends to do well on grass. The weakness of it, of course, is the one-hander, but the players have learned how to move back and also move up. There was a wonderful uh, article and uh, I think a video montage on the New York Times on Vavrinka's one-hander and just showed how he hit it that was really instructive, so I recommend looking at that. Outstanding. That's really helpful. I, I know one of the things that you you told me that was extremely helpful was thinking about loading that left leg. Getting That's... the left leg behind the ball and driving, driving and then coming in. And watching out that you don't get too close. That limits your options. Uh, you can't really open up with the hips. Um, yeah, footwork is, is paramount on the one-hander. Um, footwork and getting the right grip. Uh, I used to, I think Steffi Graf fell into this, not that we're in the same neighborhood as players, but um, I used to get caught with my chip grip and realize I had to hit over the ball and it was too late. So I had to learn, really turn that grip over using the left hand to turn and, uh, and experimenting with it. There's a wonderful old classic book, Vic Braden's Tennis for the Future, and I used to set up a ball machine in the book. I'd open the book to the backhand page and just work on my one-hander and had to do with getting underneath the ball and coming up with top. And I went from kind of a rose wall chip to more of a Guillermo Vilas, I'm dating myself here quite a bit, a Guillermo Vilas topspin rip. For the younger uh, folks out there on Tennis Warehouse, I believe that Guillermo Vilas of Argentina, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, actually held the record for consecutive clay court wins until yeah. Nadal broke it fairly recently. Yeah, he was the Nadal of his day, also lefty, uh, also just physically, they called him the bull of the pompous. Um, incredible clay court player. Yes, a, a specimen, if I remember, yeah. and, and a poet. A poet, although the Argentinian author Jorge Luis Borges, who was blind, said, Vilas writes poetry as well as I play tennis. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> on that note, perhaps it's thank time you. to wrap up for today. But again, Jeff, right here. Ms. Kent, thank you, thank you enough for taking the time. And thank you, uh, Tennis Warehouse. We, we really do appreciate our peeps at Tennis Warehouse and all the, all the kindnesses over the years. And hopefully this is a little bit of giving back. Awesome. Thank all you. Right. Thank you.